have uh, Dr. Eric Avery, we have Sue Coe, and then we have Cassandra Romero who will be moderating today's conversation. Um, we're very privileged to have these artists in our house, and thank you again for our partnership with Tammy Yu. Thank you to Jesse Shaw, to the Tammy Yu printmaking department, to the Tammy Yu um, PR department um, for making this all possible for the one exhibit, two spaces. And without further ado, I'll let them get started. <laughs> Sounds good? Yes? Okay, perfect. So, um, just very briefly, once again, my name is Cassandra Romero. I had such an amazing opportunity to curate this show, to get up close and personal to all this art and all of this ephemera that uh, Sue and Eric have exchanged over their 40-year friendship. And in case you aren't familiar with their work, which I hope you are, um, both extremely prolific artists um, and just amazing friends, and I'm so excited to be able to help to, to be here, to, to continue this conversation, um, and just get you to know, get you, help you know who Eric and Sue are, okay? So um, I'm just gonna jump right into it. So um, one of the big things between both exhibits is um, this idea of friendship, right? Um, in so many ways, and we'll, we'll touch on those subjects in just a moment. But um, as you know, uh, Eric, psychiatrist, retired psychiatrist, retired um, physician, but also um, printmaker. And then Sue, lifelong artist as well, lifelong witness. So um, because of these things, they were able to coordinate two visits, one in 1993, where Sue came to visit Eric in his medical practice and was able to witness, to work with you know his patients, listen to his stories, and again in 2006 with incarcerated women living with HIV. However, their story of friendship doesn't start there. It starts years earlier, so I really want to take a moment to um, allow them to open with that, how, how they first met. So I'll pass that on to you for a moment so you can dis discuss um, where your friendship began. Okay, so. <laughs> Not retired from psychiatry. This is a clinic. <laughs> it's a it's a different practice. Anyway, Cassandra. So um, I try not to speak after Sue. So I'm going to speak first. So what I remember Sue was I knew her work from the op-ed page of the New York Times, and uh, I knew she this incredible artist. And I also uh, 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 got the print collector's newsletter, and and, and there was a. a a small piece about the women uh, raped and the, the women raped in New Bedford on the pool table. And I think the image was reproduced and it described it and then it was available at PPOW in New York. I was in my psychiatry training in New York. So I went to PPOW and asked if I could buy this photo engraving. It's in the exhibit. And the receipt when Cassandra and I started going through I want to thank you all for coming. I forgot to do that. And of course, thank Cassandra for what she's doing. Thank you for coming to the center. So I'm a little anxious. <coughs> In any case, so to answer your question, so I bought some of my first works of Suko, and then I wrote to her. And then she said, stop buying my prints and I'll send them to you. I also think, and Sue might remember, that when I was working in Somalia, I, I, I think I wrote to Sue because I thought if I could have uh, there, the Somalia works over there, this show is art, this medicine, this is work I've made to survive. So I think I wrote to Sue and said, I wish we had artists here that could help us in these places because we need this creative thinking about how you can feed starving people and live and survive in this incredible world. And so I started. Uh, uh, buying Susan, she started sending it to me, and then I visited with her in New York. I told the story last night, of knocking on her door, Suko, and all this stuff. And can I tell the story again? So she was in this railroad flat place in New York, and the door opens with the chain on it like this, and there's just all these dogs just behind them. Oh, you know, it's one of my fears with people dog fear of being attacked. So uh, 
like this, and she said, uh, it's okay, put your hand through. I put my hand into this unknown space with dogs going crazy, and she put a biscuit in my hand. <laughs> and then she said, okay, unlatched the door, and then I went in. And I didn't say this last night, but I'm going to describe your place. It was this little small room. And then in the middle room, I think a little bathroom, and then there was a um, flat file, and then on top of it was like a bed where you would sleep. And now I'm walking back into the back space that you were in, and you were working on this huge piece on, up on a flat surface. And against the back wall where windows out into the back side of this building, there was rats rescued from, uh, from a yeah. lab, were running around in your apartment like this, in that space, and I don't think it was a cage, but there was all this rat stuff, and so, oh my God. <laughs> so, so we sat on the floor, and uh, I think we had, a, I think, a glass of sherry or something like that, and that's how we met. Wow. These were hairless rats, because they're probably labs to be hairless, and they had giant tumors. And my neighbors said, is that a rat? And I said, it's a Mexican hairless, because it sounds better. It sounds beautiful, like a chihuahua. And they said, that looks like a rat. I said, no, 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 Mexican hairless. <laughs> But they were running around, they lived in the teapot, and I did have a pit bull, and then I put the rats on people's shoulders. I think that. Yeah, I put them on the shoulders, and then one time they did bite someone who was an art director. Oh, and you know that, um, you know that rock musician in the Kinks? He's the lead singer. Well, he came over, because I had to do his album cover, it was really boring. And anyway, I put a rat on him and he went insane. And he ran up onto the roof of the building. And he said, that's my phobia. It's what the album's called, the King's Phobia. You put a rat on me. <laughs> and then he was so frightened, he ran down my three-story walk up backwards. Backwards. <laughs> And that should have been the end of the relationship. <laughs> but no, the art director was desperate because she couldn't work with him and he'd been through so many artists and now it was a deadline, I had to do it. It's the worst album cover ever done, ever. But anyway, I got 500. But I'm surprised you remembered the rat, so. <laughs> anyway, Eric wrote to me from Somalia, that's where I remembered him, and he was, he found wood, which is rare, and he was carving wood. And I thought, oh, this guy's brilliant. So I thought, oh, I'll have him. You know, I'll take him for one of my inspiration people because he's brave, he's intelligent, and he's extremely talented. So how can I possibly keep it? How can I be interesting? That's always a challenge. <laughs> you know, to keep interesting to the person. What else? So... <laughs> Oh, for a second. So that was 40 years ago, so that's a long time, and yeah. we've had a number of experiences. This is the most recent clinic that she's, forget that I said this was a clinic, but this, uh, the piece that's on the wall in the back that's food is medicine is a woodcut, pretty much a first in that camp. And somebody from Canada called me and he said, you're the doctor from that camp. Did you give me, yes, yes, it's the food is medicine. She said, I, this is 40 years later. She said, I still have that on my refrigerator and I look at it every day. I just want to thank you for it. This is out of the blue. And so I said, then I chose art is medicine. I made that when I got to this camp, people were having breakdowns because it was so horrible. And so the head nurse was leaving and so I printed a certificate of graduation or survival from this place and became part of saying goodbye to people 
the one that's there is me, I printed for myself. It was more important than my medical degree in my office. So, uh, so when I had that email from this person, I went in, <coughs> into my storage place and I got it out because that for, <coughs> that for me is art as medicine, that piece that I made, the woodcut that I made. Absolutely incredible. Thank you for sharing. Um, so glad we get to hear that. Um, can't really find it anywhere else other than hearing it from their own, you know, voices. So um, now I want to jump forward a little bit to um, Sue's first visit to UTMB's, uh, which is the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, which um, Eric was part of bringing Sue over to visit with um, you know, patients living with AIDS during that time. So I was um, hoping, Eric, that you could give us a little bit more insight on how um, that was brought about, and then Sue, if you could share really anything you want to about that experience and the art that came out from it. So I, I can tell long stories, so it's hard for me to tell short stories, but when I, when I was a medical, medical student at UTMB with an art degree, is that my device? When I was a medical student at UTMB in Galveston, I had an art degree, and uh, so of course I made art to get through medical school, and uh, uh, the, 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 the medical humanities were forming as, uh, as, a, as a pedagogic discipline within medical education, and it was the second place it formed was at UTMB where I was. Uh, a medical student, so I associated with the medical humanities at its birth, and I was always pushing the visual should be part of these humanities, not philosophy, religion, history, all those, but the visual should be included, so that's been my shtick for my entire life. So now, I, uh, after I finished all my training and I stopped medicine for 11 years and was living in San Ignacio, my artist friends let me stay in his studio, Michael Tracy. That's how I ended up in South Texas, then in Africa, I did all this stuff. When I came back, I was just doing art and recovering from UTMB that's on the walls, this recovery of making art, appropriating Posada. And my friends started dying in Houston of AIDS. My best friends were dying and I had all this training. And so I went back into medicine at my medical school and was an assistant professor. And now I'm in the, they, a part of my hire was to keep, protect time so I could make art about what I did with AIDS through the Institute for Medical Humanities. And so I said, well, I wanted to bring artists into the places that I've been. And I knew Sue, and so I'm in in a in an institutional context, so that I could invite her, and it could be a job for her to come down and visit and experience this with me. And I had no idea what would happen, and so Sue showed up, and. Uh, uh, the director of the Institute for Humanities, he said the one thing when Sue visits she can't do is she can't visit the animal care facility, not care, it's where the animals are kept for use for experiments. She said, section. The vivisection section of where this building, she can't be around that. And we're going to have a press person with her when she's on this campus. So I told Sue, okay, Sue, you're coming, but this is the one thing. And she said, Eric, there are two things that would ruin our friendship. And one is crossing a picket line, and the second was what you just told me about not being around these animals that are being tortured. <clears throat> but I'm going to come. Okay, you get one pass or something like that. So Sue comes and she then spent a week with me in, in my uh, clinical uh, experience. And the press, every day when you would show up, she disappeared. And we couldn't find out. She would show up when she was supposed to be someplace, but she was gone. We didn't know. At the end of her visit, she had been organizing hospital workers to form a union down in the laundry part of UTMB. I couldn't believe they weren't wow. unionized. So that's what she was doing while she was there and not hanging out in the wards and doing all this stuff. And the person that's over there that has Kaposi's on his back, it is the person that had told me that she couldn't go around the animal 
vivisection section. So Sue didn't really put all of this as me, the psychiatrist now looking. That piece that she gave the guy Kaposa sarcomas to, she had his shirt off and drew him in his office. I was off doing my clinical stuff. And I think your print person maybe posed for you when you made the standing figure. So that's the connection of, of that particular print and that first visit. And then it was a couple of weeks, months later, this Village Voice piece came out, which is fully displayed out at TAMU. I covered it up with my patients, so if you really want to see it, you need to go to TAMU. But that's work that came from that visit to UTMB. And Ms. Sue, if you'd like to share anything from that visit in the art, visiting with the patients, listening to their stories. Uh, it was traumatizing. That's a big statement right there, I agree. So um, I wanted to segue also into um, a similar visit in 2006 when she went over a second time with Dr. Eric Avery. This time it was um, sponsored by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, uh, Sue's second time in Texas. So Eric, could you tell us a little bit more about how that one came about? Same, same, same thing. Can we start with Sue? <laughs> So she can speak because I would just talk. We can't do art here. We have to talk. We have to use language and words. So what was it like for you to come and to come in to do that prison work? Well, what I learned about Eric and I is I hear people's words and I believe what they're saying. Eric hears people's words and he sees the library behind the words. So Eric told me in the car on the way here that I'm not interested in psychology, which is true. <laughs> but so all the prisoners, um, the incarcerated women we spoke with, I believed everything they said completely. And then Eric said, uh, that's not true. And I said, no, it must be true. So then we went to the zoo to find the truth of what the woman said, remember? That she lived with a panther and oh. kept, remember? And we had to track down the sugar daddy. And, but in terms of how I saw the hospital back to the AIDS ward, which in many ways was a hospice ward because the antivirals hadn't been, hadn't come around yet. So it was a terrible. It's a really, really sad time, and I go back there, you know, you know talk and leave that. The, the, prison, the prison women were my patient. The, step, the medical facility near UTMB where women with HIV were congregated so they could get care had been, were my patients. And uh, they agreed to, to speak with me. And so I would talk with them about their lives and, as I would as a psychiatrist and knew them already. And Sue drew them while we were talking. Because it slows time down. So when you're with someone and you're drawing them, you're not stealing their life. You can give them the work. They can see what you're doing. And if they don't like it, it won't ever be published. I mean, we had that agreement, Eric and I, that if anyone objected to the work because it, if it was inaccurate, then their dignity and their right to be depicted is paramount. So I went back with the work to check out with all the staff and is this accurate? Um, so I think it was an older journalist, Dan, no, Walter Cronkite, who said you should never be ashamed to go back to any way you've reported on. So I, I remembered that and I thought, that's it. 
that I never want to take anyone's struggle and have it in an art gallery or some magazine without their collaboration and without, because that's their gift to me is telling me about their lives and they can have the artwork, they can have it. And that's, that's about it. But Eric just sees below the surface more than I do. So that's why we have this, one of the many reasons why we have friendship is I listen to the literal words. And he's looking at other maps of that humor. I think it's very interesting, but you know, I had a show of uh, all the portraits we did in, uh, recently, and I said, and everyone died. And then this man in the audience, he goes, I didn't die. I'm one of your portraits. I'm here. This was amazing. It was like a resurrection. He just survived long enough for the antivirals. That was called the Lazarus Syndrome. Yeah, the antivirals yeah, yeah. came it. out so that people who were dying could get on medication. I've depicted it in the life cycle of yeah. HIV because the, the wallpaper for that clinic in Harvard shows the early medicines coming into the lymphocyte. They had medicines for that, but once it was in DNA, it kept coming out. And when they made the second medication, one of the people at UTMB was working on the exit once they closed the exit, they shut down the factory making HIV. It was called the Lazarus Syndrome. Patients just got up out the death. I mean, you yeah. saved that house. Well. I mean, the staff, the staff, the cleaners, the nurses, the doctors, the psychiatrists, social. You all saved him. He's a happy, productive, married man with his partner in, in Santa Barbara. From seeing him as a skeleton? One of the prisoner women had been discharged, one of our oh. patients, and was yeah. living in Houston, and we got her address. And you also wanted to go to the zoo in Houston, famous zoo, so you right. could do that. She also told us about the, uh, the, the discharge from the prison system, and you go to the McDonald's, you're in the bus, and you end up at McDonald's, and at McDonald's, that's where the crack is being sold. Oh, so the trains, the, the bus station. So we went to, we tracked her down where she was, and we went to her house, and her sugar daddy, it was her, sugar her, daddy's her, house. Her, her person who managed yeah. their, her sex work was, was dying in the back, in the back Well, room. Eric discovered him dying. And so... We, which we drew, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, it's, right. it's around yeah. on that side. It's Eric around. said, oh, by the way, he's, there's someone dying here. And I thought, can't we just focus on this? No. So we have to go in the back room, and he had 100 hats hung up. Um, but she was a beauty. She was super smart. And she educated us, or me, she educated me about her babies. and how she was abused as a child and a family member and how they uh, within African American family she never revealed the name. So that work that Sue made, it's all in May at Yale in the Cushing Whitney Medical uh, the Library of Medical History Collection, all that work is there and they set up interview like this where I was going to interview Sue, this is at Yale, and uh, it was just going to be this conversation. So the first thing that I did was I went and bought leatherless shoes, and, uh, and I had a non-leather belt, of course Sue knew. She appreciated that I made an effort to deal with this animal, dead flesh on my, uh, on my body. And I was told by the, the person who had invited us that one, I needed to dress in a particular way for this. I mean, I'm a faculty at a medical school, like what I needed to wear, and I thanked her. And then she said, and you also need to keep Sue from talking about animal rights. Oh, for <laughs> sake. That's, That's so I was supposed to control the conversation with Sue about animals. I said, Susan, okay, Susan, I mean, I will do what I can, but I know Sue, and 
you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Okay. So I want to circle back to this um, idea um, of being witnesses in your art. So this overarching um, title for both exhibits is Ways of Seeing. A couple of weeks ago in Eric's um, artist talk, right after the opening of this exhibit, he shared with us that for him, he created art as a way to stay alive, and Sue makes art to change lives. So I kind of wanted for both of you to describe um, a little bit more of those two ways of creating art, but also where they intersect, where they merge, perhaps. So if you could share a little bit more on that. That's a great question. <laughs> Pass it to Sue. <laughs> you know, Cassandra's IQ is like double mine. <laughs> <laughs> Been here so long, chain smoke. Okay. Anyway, the point of my drawing in the work is to get access to places that won't allow photography. So just to have a pencil and people can see what you're doing, that's part of the process of witnessing without power. Um, if you witness with power, you're not. Um, aligning yourself with the victim of oppression. So there's always this um, dynamic of how much power don't I have in this situation? So within a slaughterhouse drawing, in slaughterhouses, you know, I've been in situations where I've been in prisons where they're training prisoners to be slaughterers. So the guards will have guns, the incarcerated men will have knives, and a woman enters that space with the animal and it changes, everything falls apart because of the hierarchy of power. So, in answer to Cassandra's question, showing up is the art. That's the first part of the art, is putting oneself in that situation, you know, where the head slaughter, in this prison slaughter has he pointed the stun gun at my head, and all the guys were laughing. And he said, do you want to participate in the slaughter? And I saw them all laughing, and I saw the cow. I was the cow now. And I felt for her, I felt the female, this animal that we don't protect, females of any species, children. And the danger, this male top-down dynamic where they're so frightened, one woman, or it could be a queer, walks into that box and the walls start collapsing. Oh, you've shattered that. So even before we get to the art, just showing up like the police, that's, the, that's next door here, and we saw police officers going in there with, is it AR-15s? So that's their morning coffee, AR-15. So one would talk to them, maybe get inside, maybe see their concerns. Um, is, so it's a witnessing without power, and then asking people, is it working? It's asking people about their lives. Um, because we're all the same person, we're all one person. Um, is that the question, Cassandra? What did you say? Um, yeah, I mentioned that. Uh, basically, this idea. Right, of, okay, yeah. good. Witnessing. Yeah, yeah it's witnessing. witnessing. It's so it's witness. not just witnessing, it's witnessing without power. If it's just witnessing, you're a tourist. If you're witnessing without power, you're 
body, your physical being is at risk. So we did Green and Common. I didn't do that with Eric, but that was a cruise missile silo. Women got in. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't want to talk about that, but I felt that, go ahead, Eric, I'm, I'm rambling now. Sorry. So Witness Wizards was, without saying, was a poster for from a Japanese artist named Munakata, one of my favorite artists that I turned Sue on to, a great woodcut Japanese artist. And you saw his show in New York, and you sent me the poster uh, from that show, and it was Ways of Seeing. And so that was this idea of uh, uh, where the title came from when Cassandra and I were meeting. And the other thing about witnessing was that one of the things that Sue had said and you focused on was Sue saying, don't look at me, the person, which you all are doing now, but look through my eyes at what I see and what I have seen. So Sue in witnessing in that way is not this incredible person who's in front of you today, that's the person, but what she wants us to do and has showed us and the prince that I, Tammy Yu, who all saw that, um, have seen what Sue has seen through her eyes, that that's what she's focused on. In my case, I wanted to make an art clinic, I wanted to make a medical clinic in an art museum. In order to do that, I needed to make a wallpaper for the clinic and hang my HIV condom filled pinatas around the clinic so a clinic could move into the art space. This was wallpaper for a hepatitis clinic where care was given to people with hepatitis at the Corcoran in DC. That print that's growing was for a project to try to demonstrate how we recover from trauma. And when you look at how the seeds are germinating in time lapse, you see like a neuron growing, how the seeds are desperately trying to grow. And if you weed it in water and in fertilizer, it has Alex has done, and today we're gonna, we're at the place we're gonna pull the plug, turn off the lights and stop the watering and let it die. That's going to happen after we finish today, and a new piece is going to come in that is a print from the other side of the wood block that is going to grow the interior limbic structure of the brain. So in that sense, my making my work is coming out of my, uh, uh, out of just <laughs> where I am. <laughs> the, big, the big nipple piece, really those are, and I told my therapist for many years that I was putting up this print where they represent sessions that I had with her over years of needing help to be needing help. <laughs> so uh, the 9-11 piece I made because of that horrible thing that happened. So in my case, it's not really witnessing it's being present and making work that will function in ways that help me do my art medicine connection and try to grow in that space. It's hard to do medical practice in art museums. It's much easier to have artists come into the medical world than it is to take medicine into the art museums. So that has been one of my challenge to do that. So my witnessing has really been as my teacher had told me, have an interesting life, make your prints. So my work is not witnessing in the sense that Sue's work is focused and we all go, oh my God, that's, and then we know that and then we can begin to change. Well, I think, um, is this, does it work? Is it, is it? You know, the greatest art in art history you could say it's Rembrandt's garroted woman. I mean, to me, that's witnessing. It's uh, outside his studio was the, um, like the killing fields where they would execute people and they garroted them. And she's hanging, he took his students out there and she's just a young girl. And they took, she killed her landlord she killed her landlord. She rebelled. And 
The hatchet is hung round her waist. And it is such a pure vision of social class struggle. Without any artifice, this is very hard to do as an artist. Because it's not looking in Eric's eyes and seeing blue eyes. Oh, blue eyes, or oh, they're brown eyes. It's looking through the eyes. And with art history, you get Goya, you get Mendes. You get this in beyond belief humility of those artists that are so great technically, they can take you into a land of magic. But their intellect is stopping them. Their intellect is telling them, put the ego yourself aside. This young woman is more important than your art career. And that's what Rembrandt shows. And that's what Goya shows. Nothing is more important than the human beings, the humanity, the struggle he's depicting. And I see the same voice in Eric's work. That these people are the most important. He's honoring them. When he draws the portrait, he's honoring their lives. And there's a dignity and a courage to that, that it's about more than just, oh, my technique, my style, my career, whatever ridiculous fancies the human life has. Um, so the history of great art is that pushing down the impulse to be different and special and be not different, not special, not special at all, because none of us is special. We're just in a, in a, in a, in a human, he struggle for humanity. Go ahead, Eric. Well, it, it, I did make, around my patients, so many of my patients in the early AIDS in those days were telling stories of terrible childhood abuse, multi verbal, physical, sexual, emotional abuse. It became, if you didn't tell me that story in your telling your story, you weren't ready to tell me that story. It was ubiquitous. And it was being figured out, the risk factors, I close my eyes so I can concentrate, but that the risk factors for using drugs and getting into the HIV exposure space often connected up to these childhood experiences. And then when you got AIDS and were dying, were stigmatized and et cetera, et cetera, all of this trauma was coming back. So it became part of the stories of my patient. And so I wanted to represent that around their portraits and the frames of, of abuse could be moved and fit on different different patients. So it's not Sophie's story, it's Sophie's and Patricia's and the other patients that were around. So in that, in that sense, I was just, and then using those stories and showing that work, so then in a university setting, a student would come up to me and say, thank you because I now can connect up my drinking to my childhood abuse and my risk for being exposed to HIV. So those, my, my, some of my work have functioned in that way of trying to educate okay. out and open up. So it's figurative art that opens up a dialogue. It's showing people stories and then people have the permission to open up about their stories and a conversation happens in this culture where people's stories are just flattened and crushed. So, so that happened when you sat in the 9-11 piece in the back. We sat and you told me the story of the bombing of the day and where you were in New York and, and what, and so you went back into your memory. Into your memory memory and the memory with dread of what's going to happen the revenge would be terrible so I just didn't have the memory of that I knew as it was happening what the revenge would entail the call for blood 
I won't say the baying dogs of war because dogs are incredible creatures, but they started baying. And then you know for every body there's going to be 2,000 more that will die. So that, how predictable capitalism is, how predictable corporate capitalism is, in its revenge for order, dominant of the corporate class, the arms sales. And then you've got this silly conspiracy theory rubbish that's just, or oh, not rubbish, doesn't matter, not relevant, just floating around everything. So for me, that, that, is, that piece is do unto others as you would have them do yeah. unto you. We bomb them, they bomb us. It's that simple. And it was, it's lined up like tic-tac-toe. That's the line that goes from the bombs to the Iraqi bomb shelter, which I called Sue. I said, Sue, I'm <coughs> making a piece. This was the 10 days after the bomb made. And she said, yes, you can use my Iraqi bomb shelter. It's in the, the her print is that she gave me is in the back. And so I put it in the center of that piece and then just made the other parts of that uh, story. So I want to touch back to what you said about using art to educate others. And, um, you know, I wrote here in my notes that in one of, in one of the excerpts, email excerpts that um, Sue sent to Eric, which is actually opened up at Tammy Hughes Exhibit, you could read it word for word, uh, Sue wrote to him, we are more interested in changing society than art on walls. It's, one, it's all one interconnected force, using art to educate and to be educated in turn. So I kind of wanted to discuss this a little bit more, the way they said that the art is educating the viewers, um, but also I think just being able to look at your friendship, could you talk about the way, you know, the way you kind of exchange knowledge as, you know, a gift, based on the context of the work you're creating. I just, I think there's so much education for everyone, not just the viewer, but like really everyone involved in this process. So if you could share a little on that. Well, Cassandra, there's two parts, I think, to that question. The first part resonated with uh, two things that I had talked to Ron about and thought about this morning, is to just ask the question to each of you here, anyone seeing this, what is art for? The second one question is, what do artists do? Those were two questions Phil Augustin asked, abstract painter who became figurative, and I saw his great show in Houston. And he was very successful, and then he just stopped, and he said, what is art for? What do we do as artists? So I just ask, you know, us, what is art for? And I, for me now, this art as medicine, this has been the way that I have helped myself to survive and be in the places that I've, that I've been in. Would you like to add anything? Um, to me, the art object is about raising money for different groups. So it's making very cheap art accessible, or if you're unemployed, you can have it for a dollar or nothing. So I can actually build, get money to rescue an animal, get one money directly to uh, maybe bring plumbing to, to a village. So. It's got this thing, this thing that has a use value, but then you can trade that, you can trade it up to make it better for, for more people. So, you know, when I first started doing prints with galleries and then prints, and I said, well, they're $10, that one's 20 They said, that's ridiculous. And I said, no, it's multiples, it's supposed to be cheap. So the art market has made this prints, they've defiled printmaking into something that's beyond the means of any 
any working class person. So my idea was always to make art I couldn't ever afford. That I could buy not just the postcard, you know when you go to a museum and you want the postcard and they never have any good postcards. But to make something like that, that anyone could have and take away, was always my idea about what art is for, the duality that it's an organizing tool and it's educational and then it has a secondary market and it's, it can build rescue, it can build sanctuary. I think that's brilliant. I mean, what a talent, because everyone loves a bit of art and you can always make something someone really loves and go, yes, you can, this is for you, you can put it up and put it on your wall. And you know, the best thing pe people show me, they've framed it. And in the rest of the world, it's not framing, they'll say, I laminated that. I laminated it. Oh, I'm so honored, it's laminated. But it's something that's accessible, affordable, and sharing. And don't, let's, don't let them take them away from us. It's a song, it's a memory, it's a ballad, it's a dance, it's a poem, it's words, it's the beauty of a line on paper, the black of a pencil going on the paper, on the back of a cornflakes package, on the back of an old shirt carton. What a, what a gift we have that we can make art out of any scraps. We can make prints without machines. You know, the first print is a kiss. Put on lipstick, kiss someone you made, you printed them with you. just talk about um, this friendship, you know, idea that we're bringing over to to both shows, that they have this connection of friendship kind of in the background of all this really impressive and powerful work. Um, so another excerpt from an uh, email that Sue wrote to Eric in 2016, she wrote about Eric saying, it's more about finding an art comrade in the slaughterhouse, someone else who bothers to notice the massive destruction, someone who is not indifferent. So... Again, I just wanted to open with that and then kind of open up this dialogue of, you know, having each other to, to listen to, you know, this crazy world that is our lives, you know. So, just kind of that. Whoever wants to go first. I've known Sue for, for a long time and uh, she's told me this before and we're driving here today and, and I said, Sue, if I say something, we can still be friends, right? You won't throw me away. Oh, this is it. This is going to be the something now. <laughs> well, I'm going out to smoke them. I mean, I'm going to be listening to something horrible. No, no, that's just my fear, you know, yeah. that I'm going to say something and then, uh, you know, I am a man and I am... Oh, uh, that's because I told you a man last night. Well, we got after, <laughs> we got back. And when, I guess, Cassandra, somehow I said something that the connection between us and I said printmaking. And Sue said that that was stupid. So, so male. I didn't say it's, stupid. Well, something. And then you said that was diesel. what a man like said. And then she said it's diesel. like people around her who talk about diesel all the time. And then I told her to just, I said, fuck you. And you I, did that. I did. I did. I never say no. that. But no. I just got, well, I didn't mean like printmaking as a technical practice in that obsessive need to make blah, blah, blah. But print, and then I had an opportunity to, where she's listening to me sort of talk about prints in this broad, broad way that I am in, in that broad word as I tried to contextualize and justify what I had said that had, had done what a man did. And I, she said, well, in the, in the emotional realm, our friendship, I can go into the emotional realm. I'm even a psychiatrist, but yes, I am a man. And we were with 85 of her prints, and so that's what came out. So 
She let me talk for about 20 minutes and, and listens while I recover my sense of who I am. We're driving in today, and of course, I have no idea what you might ask Cassandra, but I thought, oh, wow, well, what if I... So Sue's not going to throw me away no. because I really screw up in a way. No. That she will take it as an opportunity to help me grow and understand what she's done over so many years, and this is part of our friendship, is that knowing someone who's a, dial who's a communist and, a dial and use a dialogic method, and I said, Sue, you never talk badly about people, you just help them understand the paradoxes and how they think they are and what they, you help them think through so they can move into the next stage of change and begin to change some of these behaviors that this we're is unconscious of. This is and this is a dialogic method that yeah. Sue, and I've seen her for years, where she helps people grow understanding, not shame, put you down, yeah. you're wrong. She just doesn't do that. So if I do say things today, or we will talk, and she will help me grow and understand the Andrew Dwork and a friend sent me this book, which Sue borrowed to read, you know, while she's here. So I am in the process of growing and understand my misogyny and all of my, my biases that I carry from my privileged <laughs> white male. I am queer. So I do, I have been a little on the <laughs> other side in that queer sense, but I still carry, and I have been a doctor, you know, oh, you know, all that power privilege stuff that I have to quiet and listen to women. <laughs> well, I think the role of art in, in these terms is, in a Marxist term, is to reveal the contradiction. We can't resolve it. That has to be the mass of people. That has to be um, the masses can resolve it. But in the American culture is you cannot give the bad news without the cure. Because it's like a movie. So I can't talk about the horrendous suffering of animals in slaughterhouses across the world unless I give the cure. Or you won't listen to it. Well, it's too bad. You know, that's up to you to create the verb, the action. That's not up to the artist. I'm not your Disney movie where this is entertainment and then it all ends well. Nope. So that's what I've been taught by comrades is we are revealing the contradictions first. That's how we get the keys to create social change. The artist cannot do that for you or it's a lie. Art doesn't happen until the viewer says this is art. When the art from the wall, without the artist, I won't be around long, the, the work will be, you know, will have ever long, but someone's going to see that. And they're going to say, this is art. This is speaking to me. Especially in terms of the global social justice movement for animal rights. So that work's already bouncing around the world and reaching an audience that I never believed possible 40 years ago. So this is now a global movement where I can go into the worst parts of the world, go anywhere, and I can say, take me to where the animal rights artists live. Take me to where artists live, take me to where the anim animal people live. And they'll know where that is. And I'll go there and I'll be with my family. Different language, different culture. That's the safe space where the stewing pot of ideas is going on and there's listening and there's openness and there's sharing information. So anywhere in the world you just say, if you're scared, just say, take me to where the artists live. Take me to where they rescue animals. And anywhere, anywhere in the world, however harsh the situation, you'll get those people. What? What, Sandra? <laughs> what, dear? But she's so patient. Brilliant. 
participation. Okay, so um, I also kind of wanted to, um, just for a brief moment, uh, talk about this connection again between, um, well, with the print, where, um, you know, Jesse Shaw, Toronto Press, uh, printing a, a print on um, zoonosis. So I, I just wanted to briefly mention that kind of this joining of things together. Um, it's a zoonotic spillover print, which is which was recently added into the museum, into, into the gallery. I'm sorry, I'm getting nervous. Into the into the gallery space yesterday, uh, right at the end before you exit. So um, I wanted to just kind of see how kind of establish how there's again this overlap in the content, um, in the research behind it, and just in the print itself. Mm -hmm. um, just discuss that. Well, there's the crook and Eric's showing it. This was, what, 18? So this is putting together viruses, but way early on. So then you cholera came from the Thames water. That's this other <coughs> print. So, so this, I used the, the Crookshank yeah. uh, Thames water print with representing things in water for the circling around. And Sue redid the Crookshank uh, cowpox, the vaccine. They were trying to use cowpox, but they figured out smallpox, you could be cowpox. So th that's the. And this is yeah. how art and science work together, because Eric did the vi he carved the viruses, the bacteria, the beautiful things. Um, could kill us. <laughs> you said yesterday that the animals are going to kill us. And yeah. the thing that you said, it's happening on at a the cellular, cellular level. level. Yeah. The animal's yes. retribution, yes. not purposeful, but the effect of this abuse of animals yes. is resulting in these 22, we only image 22 in the print that Jesse made, all origin can come from animals. And, and our lives are misuse of animals. Uh, HIV, COVID, bats, they're all coming from what's happening on the earth and then the animals and then the humans. And it's not good news. And the But it has, is good news. Well, the good news, well, okay, that's that, let's see. I think it's not good news that so many people are gonna die from this. Well, so many animals are dying from humans. The species. We're animal, yeah, speciesism to assume humans have a greater value. Darwin, can we go back to Darwin? The emotional lives of animals. So even by questioning that somehow it's anti-humanist. No, it's, this is science. The emotional lives of animals, Darwin. So, no, it's not even good or bad. It's animals are resisting on a cellular level. They're changing their bodies. And unfortunately, other animals are going to be wiped out. That's how Humans. this system... I'm being very sensitive to your needs. <laughs> other animals, human animals, could be gone. Now, I don't want those humans gone in any way, shape, or form, because they're going to be the most innocent. They're going to be the ones that didn't create this. They're going to be the ones that eat a few beans and corn and rice. They're going to be in the forefront being shoved off, because that's the whole class system. It's not going to be the creators of this constant genocide of all life. It's not going to be the corporate it's going to be the poor countries, the, the people that actually care about life and nurture it and have plants and animals and look after everything. So no, I don't, I will not know, but they're the forefront. So this would be an example of how Sue will teach me about speciesism. Speciesism. So, speciesism. Which is a hierarchy putting the old pyramid of humans on top, which is always male, male on top, and everyone else less. But if all humming, if all bees died, which they are dying en masse, we have three 
years left to live. So pollinators are being destroyed because of GMO crops. I, I don't know the science of this, but it's Dow. Um, it's the chemicals of GMO crops that insects are pollinating and they're bringing back fungi to the, um, to the hives. I don't quote me on this, it's, it's compli complex science, but it's so, some of these crops are banned in Europe because of this. You know, and tech, the tech fascist is thinking, oh, we can have robo bees. Oh, fuck off. Fucking twat. You couldn't even find your own whatever. So there's always this tech, oh, way out of it. Oh, yes, no. So pollinators and moths pollinate from the accumulation of UV rays during the day, so then they fly at night and they're still seeing in a UV spectrum, which we can't do. So their whole world is purples and blues and amazing colors and these are sentient. So they're not robotic. And idiot tech overlords believe you can make a robotic pollinator. When moths and bees, they're sentient. They're not going to keep bashing themselves up against the window when they get trapped in the house. They're going to find a way out. So to protect the pollinators is to protect our food, is to protect humanity, and not allow corporate overlords to decide we're going to have this or that GMO crop and we're going to breed chickens so they won't get salmonella or you know they had a, a thing where they put eyeglasses on chickens it was just insane the adaptions to make more profit anyway i could go on that's boring you'll get bored don't make me make So the, one of the final questions I actually had uh, for Sue, um, so that we can close out. So yesterday at um, the exhibition opening, I had some conversations with viewers and you know the work they saw was, was really strong, but somebody expressed to me they felt kind of, kind of hopeless in the sense that they were an individual, like what could they do just like viewing this, you know? And in one of your artist talks this week, you mentioned that involvement is a revolution, getting people to show up is radical. So I wanted you to just kind of close out on that and you know, discuss from the individual to the community to change. Well, I'm going to promote um, what Cassandra and I believe in unity, which is to go vegan now. Don't wait even for your next meal, do it now. Because that will drop, we're supposed to halve um, emissions of the deadly gas by 2030. We're not going to meet that. It's not going to happen. So unless you've got the imagination to see what the, the world after 2030 is going to look like, if you don't have that imagination, then trust me to go vegan because we can cut that by a third by avoiding all animal agriculture. Abolition of animal use. This is something everyone can do here. Not maybe in some parts of the world, but we can do that now. We can do that next meal. I don't want to hear about your palate pleasure and how you loved cheese as a child. I mean, no. That was, that's 1970s. This is 2023. We only have a few years we can drop it by removing all animal use. Abolition of all animal use. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this has to be acted on. It's a verb, it's an action. It's not your feelings. It's something we all can do. And it's so easy. And uh, Cassandra's, you know, Cassandra say about the help line, help, where they go to the web page and they can get information. Oh yes, um, locally here, if you want to you know, find out more about how you can make veganism really easy, um, 
very convenient because a lot of times we, we search for convenience. Being vegan can be convenient. Um, you can check out Laredo Vegan's Facebook page. It is an awesome resource. A lot of great people there to help. Um, help you get started, help you, you know, convert your fridge if that's what you're looking for. So Laredo Vegan's on, on Facebook. And a lot of time, you know, people will say, oh, it's too expensive to go vegan. I can't afford that phone. I'm going to You've got to learn how to cook, okay? This is your time to be grown up. Grown ups cook, they make food, they can steam corn, um, they can steam potatoes. I mean, there's cheap ways of making beans where you're not using up a lot of power. Um, no, it's not gonna be handed to you on a plate, and I'm sorry we can't make vegan fast food cheaper for you. So sorry. Well, Cry me a river. Try looking into the eyes of a, of a cow in a slaughterhouse. You know, go there, stay there for a day, see how she feels, removed from her herd, removed from her family. So absolutely not, there's no more excuses. So you can be cheaper, you can live, you can be healthier, you can be more creative. Um, and as Cassandra said, this helplines, but don't buy faux stuff unless you're rich. That's not learning how to cook. That's not learning about the foods of the world, is it? No. Three sisters, corn, bean, squash. It's America, the food of the Americas. Corns, bean, squash, three sisters, the beautiful sisters. Best food in the world. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so as far as time points. Can I speak on yes. behalf of Hope, which I don't have? Absolutely. But <laughs> I just wanted to add that uh, gathering together as we are today is an opportunity to share and to learn. And there is hope in, in being together and growing friendships and being together, knowing Cassandra and learning and being around some of her yeah. friends. There is a vegan a picnic at three o'clock at Casa Ortiz that all people are welcome to come to this afternoon where we are saying goodbye to Sue, with the completely vegan, and it's Laredo Art Center and the TAMU, were the TAMU students and the Art Center, that's been one of my goals of this exhibit was to combine these two institutions in Laredo so that you could grow this, this comradeship, this art bond between the younger people and those of us that might be older and working in other dimensions. So that is part of the hopefulness is for to learn from each other but to be around younger people to support younger people like Alex who has kept that print growing for three weeks. It's gonna help and help pull its end its life this afternoon and say goodbye to something that he has done on Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, when he comes in and does three times a day like a nurse would in an intensive care unit. So, uh, you know, that uh, the younger people supporting them and helping them grow and learning from them and what they're going and how they understand how we're going to get through this. And certainly the artists are going to be the ones that are going to come up with these ways of how we move through this and, and move into the future. And I want to thank Sue for coming and opening up this space in our brains and our lives and for it to happen in a wonderful exhibit is, I don't want to cry, but this is a really special moment for me in my life to have this, this thing happen in the radio in my life now, and to thank Sue and Cassandra for, for uh, and Jesse for really facilitating making this moment in time when we can be together, people who come to be with us. Absolutely beautiful way to, to, to close this out, yes, wonderful. So um, as far as time, we are going to wrap up, but before we do that, um, I of course want to open this up to the audience, if there's any questions for Eric and Sue or both of them, yes, I can pass the mic over.
both. It was a fantastic presentation. I agree with you 100 on the gastroenterologist. The rainbow is what can save the earth from this climate change. The rainbow is basically what we post on that we're buying get healthier. The more color we eat, the healthier we're going to be. I, you know, I, I recommend this to all my patients. I come in with diverticulitis, fatty liver. I, I have a lot of people with, with HIV, hepatitis. But what you're saying is 100% correct. But, you, but, you, but what you both have said also is to art, to your art, you can educate the public on the rainbow. Now, what you said about 9 11, there's going to be a re there's going to be another, there's going to be a counter bombing. I, I wish, I hope that both of you can read Barbara Tuckman. She's a fantastic, she wrote a book called The March of Bali. But she starts in Helen of Troy to Vietnam. She's already gone to, to the next world. It's called the Game of March of Bali. And if you can read that book, and then you can, and you can act, and you can put that into your art. Because Carl Sagan, when he was around, he showed us that with 14 nuclear bombs, the animals, the humans, all of us will be gone. Our only planet will be gone because it only takes us 14 nuclear bombs. With radiation, 235,000 years, none of us will be around. And you read that book, you see the human mistakes after human mistakes, fighting and fighting and fighting. Even before we knew the work that Eisenhower told us, he said it to us very clearly, the military and social conflict. I'm a Vietnam veteran, so I was in Vietnam myself. Again, you, you're fantastic. I, mean, I, see your, I see the liver, I'm a I'm a gastro, I'm a hepatologist. I, I, and it's wonderful what both of you are doing. The rainbow. And, and the book on the rainbow is called the Fabrifield Cookbook. This author is of the book on the microbiome, the, the rainbow system. And a lot of recipes are there. You're, you're right. It's very inexpensive to go with the rainbow. I personally do the rainbow. I've been doing the rainbow now since I saw cancer, heart attacks, Alzheimer's connected to the animals. So they're, they're killing them, but they're killing us. Yeah. I see more cancers on that. And all this artificial stuff, all the, all the artificial sodas and all this stuff. I had a patient last week that was yelling his eyes. I could feel and know them that super and we clear and you have pancreatic cancer. And here's and here he was with the with the guy coke right on his next to his table and at the hospital bragging about breaking coke for forty years. I couldn't tell him you got your cancer because you've been doing it for forty years in the pancreas. I told him how but I told him it was you would make a perfect commercial for Coca-Cola. Again, both of you are fantastic, thank you very much. I mean I encourage you. Barbara Tuckman gave us give us that gift of her intelligence and the of the follies of human beings, the march of folly, from head on the trip to Vietnam. We're doing it right now. We're, mm -hmm. we're being baited to, to be able to fight China. And, exactly. And then you have monsters That's like exactly right. and, and you have monsters like Putin though. He's another Hitler. Exactly. And, and so you have monsters like Putin that have to be put away. But he's been a monster since he took over in 1998. He's murdered every good Russian, yeah. every honest Russian. He's yeah. thrown over the, over the windows. He's a murderer. He's a piece of worse than Stalin, who murdered 10 million Ukrainians and the, the Red Famine. I'm saying, I don't want to ever be one kind of But again, I would encourage you both to read. You know, the, I, the will, I will read it. The March of Folly, and then, and then to become more of the rainbow, everybody should get the book, the Fiber Field Cookbook. And, and again, Put that, put that education in, into your art because because we have very little time left. I know. So we have very little time left. I know. And all it takes are 14 nuclear bombs and there's nothing around. But thank you very much both for coming. That's brilliant. I just want to point out that when you're slaughtering animals in the slaughterhouse, what you're seeing is their cancerous growth. So these are all young animals, lifespan of a cow for slaughter is four to six years. Their real lifespan is 30 years you're seeing massive cancers, which is the fastest growing protein cell. And they're just lopping those off. Those are going to your food supply because they're so unhealthy. The animals are fed constantly. Um, yeah, they're growth hormones. They're fed uh, antibiotics which function as a growth hormone in the animal. So they're growing a massively speeded up rate, which is cancer. And that's what people consume. Were you in cancer? Yeah. I mean, I've never focused on human health because it seems so opportunistic to me. It's like a denial of animals as beings themselves. It's like 
we shouldn't stop eating animals because it's bad for our health. You know, our bad health is in the mind, it's the lack of curiosity, but it's a factor now, it's a factor, human health, climate, and animal rights. It's all now interlinked. I was gonna, I'm so glad you mentioned the nuclear because what are we, six minutes to midnight? Or six seconds? How are they gonna keep passing this down? You know, Putin refused to sign the start, start treaty. This is very dangerous. It's meaningless, start treaty is meaningless, but it's a something on paper. It's a beginning, it's something, refused to sign it. No, you're absolutely right about China. They're another Cold War brewing, so profitable. You know, this is outrageous that now it's just, we think nuclear, no, that's not even on our little book of, of fears. It's now more frightening than ever, ever before. In 1962, we were gonna drop 4,000 nuclear bombs on Russia. The Russians had 164, 164 nuclear bombs on Cuba. If we get attacked in one day, 4,164 nuclear bombs would have cut off, and it would be here yeah. today. That we had a better person in Russia who was from Ukraine. We had a better person in Kennedy. That's right. And, and that they was what made yeah. the difference because they- Exactly. They and that's why there was peace in 1962 yes. instead of the destruction of our planet. Well, we don't even have that statecraft anymore, where exactly. you have leaders that have the ability to vocalize. So there we were saved, because that's why you, you elect people that can vocalize somewhat. But this is now so critical. We have so many uh, avenues to, um, but it's not scare, I'm not saying anything, to, and you're not either, to scare people, that's not the well, point. Yeah, I know. We've got to do something. Um, but do it to your heart, sooner know, yeah, than yeah, later. Sooner, okay. Did yeah. you read? Yeah. Both yeah. can do it. Right, yeah. Your okay. heart yeah. oh. It's creative. You can do it. You're a good person. We're all humans. We're all yeah. humans. Yeah. Is there anybody else who might have a question for uh, Eric or Sue, or both of them? Okay, we'll be around. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. So, thank you.